Boys in the Sand, directed by Wakefield Poole, was released during the golden age of porn and was the precursor to the straight porn industry's deep throat. It was the first gay porn film to include credits and to be reviewed by the film industry's journal Variety and the New York Times. Produced on a budget of about $4,800, Boys in the Sand consists of three segments featuring Casey Donovan's sexual exploits on Fire Island. It was promoted in a way that was unheard of at the time for a gay porn film. The film premiered at the 55th Street Playhouse in Manhattan to rave reviews and audiences lining up outside and around the block to watch it. On tonight's episode, we're going to discuss Wakefield Pool's Boys in the Sand, a landmark entry in gay adult entertainment, which critics have called the seminal gay porn film and fired one of the opening shots in an unprecedented assault on the gray wall of moral and social conservatism that had set the standards to which everyone adhered. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. Before we continue, I want to remind you to help this channel by clicking the subscribe button and selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. It all started one fateful night, when Wakefield Poole, a trained dancer, choreographer, and Broadway performer went to see Tom DeSimone's Highway Hustler. DeSimone, whose work will also be featured on this channel on a later episode, also contributed to the early days of gay porn, but this may have been one of his weaker entries. It's, it's surfing hard. Not really. It certainly builds your body. Surfing affects every part of your body. Every part? After watching the film, Poole allegedly told his friend that this was the worst, ugliest movie he had ever seen, and somebody should be able to do better than this. And with that, Wakefield Poole did. With the help of his partner at the time and accidental porn star Peter Fisk, Poole set out to Fire Island and shot a 10-minute segment called Bayside. Happy with the initial shoot, Poole planned to shoot two more segments and seek distribution for his work. After hearing Poole's intention to land a big distribution deal for the film, Peter Fisk's scene partner refused to sign release forms until he was guaranteed 20% of the profits from the film. To which Poole replied, I can shoot it again for that money. And he did. Enter Casey Donovan. Casey Donovan came on to star in one of the segments. He enjoyed Casey so much, he decided to reshoot the first segment and loosely base the rest of the film around Donovan. There's a bit of conflicting information on the film's budget. As I've heard it straight from Poole's mouth, it was $4,800, but has been reported to have been $8,000. Either way, the project was completed over three weekends in August of 1971. The 1969 explosion of gay hardcore film was in search of direction. Before we get to the release of Boys in the Sand, I just wanted to give you a bit of a backstory of why this film was so different from other gay porn films from this point in time. If you watched the first episode of Demystifying Gay Porn, you will have learned what a porn loop was. A porn loop was an 8mm filmed movie that were anywhere between 5 and 15 minutes in length, often low quality, and like other film at the time, allegedly supplied by the mafia. From muffled audio to the soundtrack that never quite coincided, not to mention probably never got clearance from the recording artists, that's what people thought of when you said porn. That and the dirty theater where it played, they were indisputably sleazy. So here was an actual film that was not a loop made by a gay man who wanted to show the beauty of men having sex. So gay porn existed before Wakefield Pool. However, he helped push other filmmakers to do better and up production quality. Boys in the Sand was completed. Pool and his financial manager went about promoting the film in a new way. They rented the 55th Street Playhouse in New York City. They cleaned up the theater from top to bottom and decorated it to give it a nicer feel. They also didn't want their patrons feeling like second-class citizens. They engaged in a pre-release publicity campaign and ran full-page ads in the New York Times and Variety magazine. They opened the doors for an afternoon screening and people slowly began to trickle in. By the time the movie was ready to begin, the theater was packed. There were lines out the door and around the corner. Straight couples and women began to show up. 
going to a screening, you might see Angela Lansbury, Liza Minnelli, or Halston in the audience. The film was a critical and commercial success. Variety, the movie industry journal, wrote a review for the film, the first of its kind. Boys in the Sand made $25,000 its first week, and within six months had grossed $140,000, for a total of $400,000 in its initial release. The film's mainstream success helped usher in the era of porno chic, which was a brief period of cultural acceptability of hardcore pornographic films. Poole and producer Marvin Shulman started selling Boys in the Sand to the home 8mm film market, making the film available for multiple reels for $99 with a suggested soundtrack insert sheet so everyone could enjoy the film the way it was meant to be enjoyed. Actor John Gielgud arranged to buy a 16mm copy and take it back to the UK so he can show it to all of his friends. Hugh Hefner and Sammy Davis Jr. also purchased 16mm copies directly from Poole and Shulman for their film libraries. Even several Hollywood studios asked for a copy, thinking they could hire Poole for something more mainstream. So what is Boys in the Sand? The film opens with the titles and credits cleverly spelled out in the sand on the beach. The first segment features Poole's lover at the time, Peter Fisk, walking through a secluded area of the beach to sunbathe naked. When out of nowhere, Casey Donovan appears from the ocean and runs towards him naked. One thing you will notice immediately are the artistic shots. Having an almost atmospheric soundtrack, the viewer is left to sit and watch the film display itself. The penetration shots are lost in shadows, something Poole has said of the film, but I think we could overlook that. He was quite clear on what he wanted to achieve, a silent picture. Dialogue was not necessary as long as the situation could be explained in cinematic terms. The second segment called Poolside again features Casey Donovan with partner Danny DiCicchio. And the first thing that caught my attention was a zoom in on the newspaper Casey holds under his arm in one of the first shots. The newspaper reads, largest bar raids in, you can't make out the rest of it. But Poole lived in a time where gay bar raids were all too common, having been arrested at a party and being charged with crimes against nature during his young life. Casey sits poolside waiting for a package from a mail order fulfillment for what seems like weeks. When it finally arrives, it arrives in pill form. And from out of the pool, pops out Daniel DiCicchio. Poole describes this scene as all intense and all real. Donovan noticed DiCicchio on the island and was lusting over him. Scouts were sent out to ask DiCicchio if he would shoot a scene with Donovan, and he agreed. So what you get is what you see during this scene. Real lust, real action. The final segment of Boys in the Sand is called Inside With and features Casey Donovan and Tommy Moore, a beautiful black model who plays the repairman ready to fix whatever Casey needs. There's some light and creative cruising before Tommy ends up in Casey's house with nothing but a tool belt. There's some toy play and the first view of what appears to be poppers I've seen in an early film. The sex is magnificent. There are no roles, just two men having unadulterated fun. This scene was particularly controversial at the time. I don't think I have to tell you why, but here's the first gay adult film in a public release featuring a full-on interracial gay hardcore sex scene. When the film was released, a lot of harsher critique came from critics who called the film nothing new and compared the film to the works of Kenneth Anger and Andy Warhol. I can't say anything nice about Andy Warhol, so I won't, but being compared to Kenneth Anger? Not too shabby. The comparison derives from the film's avant-garde and free approach to the narrative aspect of the film. It's there, but let's have fun with it. Boys in the Sand has since been remastered. When you watch it, get the remastered version and enjoy. Boys in the Sand was a phenomenal, artistically photographed, sexually explicit narrative film set to classical music and featuring only male actors. The actors had unsimulated sex with each other on the beach, by a pool, and in a glamorous Fire Island house. It was presented and advertised as a legitimate film because it had no precedent. It wasn't like the CD loops that ran at the 42nd Street porno houses. It was gay sex positive, and showed gay male sex as something beautiful and to be admired. And the film made a lot of money. It provided a template on how to market a sex film. It also launched the career of Casey Donovan as an iconic vision of gay masculinity. The film sequel, Boys in the Sand 2, was eventually released in 1986, but in the much-changed film and porn markets, it did not match the success of the original. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. 
Demystifying Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Telegram. If you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn, where you can help this YouTube channel and I can continue making content like this. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande. And if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers. Cheers.